ideas that will come up in this decade uh, that they uh, uh, they put in context from from the point of view of the experiments that we have right now and that we hope we'll have by the time that those uh, come along, right? And I think one of the important things that is new to us in this field is the idea of using multi-messenger probes for cosmology. And the page here, what you're seeing is an example of um, GW170817, the one and only event for which we were able to detect both the gravitational waves and the electromagnetic counterpart and use uh, so that we could use it uh, for cosmology in a, in a way that is analogous to supernova with um, using the distance information from gravitational waves and the redshift from the um, uh, electromagnetic counterpart. Now, if you go to the next page, you'll see um, the size of the, uh, let's say, um, uh, actually, you see uh, an introduction there to the dark energy survey. So this is my, my area of expertise is more on ground-based surveys. And in particular, I'm a member of the ES, which is a survey that was um, that completed just recently. And um, the key thing that I wanted to point out here is that DES was pioneering one aspect here of dark energy research, which was by design, it was uh, made to combine multiple probes of dark energy, probes that you could de detect obviously from the ground, but multiple probes. This meant doing a program for supernova and a program for wide uh, area uh, observation of millions of galaxies in over 5,000 square degrees. And uh, nobody thought that gravitational waves would be a probe at that time when we were planning the, the survey. But once it became clear that it could be, we decided to incorporate that too. So, um, I think that going forward, what we are seeing already, for example, in uh, the Decado and also in the snow mass process when people of other communities are planning future experiments for dark energy uh, and other science as well, uh, what we see is that uh, the tendency of um, multiplexing, you know, the number of probes and also combining uh, obs observational data from multiple experiments and facilities. And that will mean facilities from the ground and from uh, um, uh, in space as well. The idea being that one single probe cannot give the full answer. And you will see in the next page uh, what I mean by that. Um, on page three, you have um, uh, one cosmological parameter, the rate of expansion of the universe today, and examples of measurements. This plot is a, little, a couple of years old, but it gives a good example of measurements made with different observables. The red ones are the supernova, uh, and black black uh, there is the Planck, um, so CMB-based results. And the big discrepancy that we often talk about uh, in this field is that discrepancy between the results that you obtain from CMB and the results that you obtain basically with every other observable. Now, is this systematic uncertainty that is creeping in or is this really new physics? And if it is new physics, what does this mean for the fundamental physics of dark energy? What is, you know, what does it mean? We don't know. And in order to figure out and, this, uh, and disentangle this, we need precision measurements and we need measurements that we can trust in terms of uh, control of systematic uncertainties. And that will come um, a, from a combination of different probes. And I think that the, there is an opportunity for uh, thinking about new experiments in space that cover a part of the parameter space that we don't cover otherwise. So um, going to the next page, um, I show in uh, one example of um, another part of the parameter space that has to do with clustering of galaxies. This is a result that came out from DES, showing that uh, also here we see as well tension between the results that you see from DES, that's the blue contour, versus what you see, for example, from Planck, which is green. This tension is not as prominent as what you see from uh, in the um, supernova and CMB results, but it's there as well. And that's another uh, hint uh, for um, uh, uh, the, the size of the challenge that we have. Uh, on the next page, what I uh, want to show is, I, I don't want to, to paint a too um, grim picture, but I decided to, to just take uh, this triangle plot with the several a param cosmological parameters, including the equation of state of dark energy, W, 
taking uh, the current DES results, that's the blue contours, and uh, adding on what would be what we would gain if we were to add, say, eight gravitational wave events like 2017 or 817. And you can see that there is some movement there in the parameter space, but this is not precision cosmology yet. You know, to really do a precision measurement, we will need really uh, to make uh, a leap in quantity and also in precision in order to make this. And that's where I believe we should be thinking outside of the box into new experiments and new, new, new ways of doing this. Um, of course, there is a room for improvement because here I'm talking about only eight events, but um, again, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a, a, it's a challenge that I think it's really exciting because it is probably the only way we are going to uh, be able to get to the bottom of what dark energy is, um, I believe. Um, so on the next page, um, I'm getting already close. Uh, oh, we, we can skip this one. So this was just an example of uh, GW17, uh, weight 17 again. And uh, the next two slides are our attempts to repeat what we did with GW17 or weight 17 in the last observing run of LIGO. And as you can see, we were not able to make a detection. We were, made, were able to make put constraints on the parameter space of mass, velocity, and uh, opacity of the ejected material in the merger of, of the two neutron stars. Um, but we were not really, uh, we, we di didn't really make a spectacular discovery like 2017 or 2017. So this is pointing to the fact that uh, we probably are not going to be able to rely on making one-to-one -one, you know, uh, detections like that in order to accumulate enough event to make a precision measurement. And that's where in the next slide, what I, uh, I'm showing is what we've been uh, pursuing uh, today is a, the combination of bright sirens, the ones that have counterparts, with dark sirens, the ones that don't. The idea is that you can use statistically a number of galaxies in the region of interest to uh, uh, to make the constraints. This plot is from a recent paper that we published showing uh, the red curve is the combination of all of the events we've had today. The gray for comparison is GW170817 along the one bright siren that we have, and the other curves are dark sirens by themselves. So um, as you can see, if we, can, if we use in a clever way the events uh, that we have, we uh, can make a measurement of H naught, and that's uh, what you're seeing there. But in order to distinguish between these two purple uh, vertical lines there, which is uh, representing supernova and, and CMB results, uh, we are far from that. We really need to make a leap forward, and that is uh, a, a challenge that we should have to face. So finally, in the next slide, I present um, a cartoon description of um, a, one way to go about this. And this would be to really fully utilize the entire range of galaxies in the future cosmological surveys, I'm thinking, when LSST is done or uh, DESI and um, other surveys that will cover uh, large volumes of the sky. Here, literally just a cartoon that I made by hand, but it, 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 it illustrates the idea that on one hand, you would have many, many gravitational wave events from the next generation, uh, survey. And on the other hand, you would have uh, a vast galaxy uh, catalog. And you can transform distances in redshifts and do the cross correlation of these two maps. And uh, with that, make a measurement of the cosmological parameters that is analogous and uses the same tools that we use today for um, BAO and large scale structure measurements. And um, I think that this is um, one way to go forward to try to um, really get greater redshift range and greater uh, numbers, statistics of events to try to uh, to get a, a, a to get the results that we need. So I will stop here and, and, and perhaps take questions. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. I, um... I do have one question. So you're you're focusing on um, you know DES, which as you as you mentioned is just uh, finished up, and and possible links to the gravitational waves. Um, so my my main question would be, uh, what do you see in the future as the the potential uh, space for 
for dark energy direct detection via quantum techniques. And if you haven't thought about that, would you be willing to, in the next few months, help help to think about that in the context of a white paper? Sure. So uh, the way um, I, that is really not one area where I've been uh, really focusing much uh, lately, but I'm really excited about it because I think um, what we would like to do is to have a way to translate what we see with these surveys, which is basically rates of expansion, clustering properties, etc., uh, translate those properties into what the uh, uh, models for uh, uh, dark energy and the observables that you would have for direct detection and a lab-based type of experiment uh, are, you know, so screening parameters and etc. And I think that if we don't have this handshake between these two sides, we are going to be in a scenario where the two communities will be speaking at each other, but not really working together. So this is one area where I'm pretty sure that other people, uh, uh, possibly other panelists here, um, uh, have more uh, expertise and will be able to uh, say more about that. But what, this is where I'm, I would be interested in, in being able to translate you know, the results that we uh, expect to get into equation of state parameters and clustering properties of galaxies and so on, so that we can uh, work, you know, with the data in both ways. Uh, all right, fantastic. Are there other um, questions about that first talk? Um, and if not, maybe, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Thank you and thank you all the speakers. Um, and uh, then maybe we can move on to the second talk uh, that's gonna touch on modified gravity um, and that's uh, Jeremy Saxteen. So go ahead, Jeremy. Okay, thank you. Um, so you, you can go ahead to the next slide if you like, or please do. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about uh, about what could possibly be driving dark energy and why it's interesting to test dark energy in the solar system and why we think that this is this is an interesting thing to do. Um, so, so to me as a theorist, dark energy is really the statement that uh, there's there's some mysterious thing out there that's pushing the universe apart and making it accelerate. Um, and so, uh, to try and understand what it is, I like to recall this quote from John Archibald Wheeler, who was one of the pioneers of general relativity, and he said that space time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to curve. And when you think about it from this perspective, there are only really two possibilities for what dark energy could be. Either it's some type of new matter fluid, which is some, has some sort of negative pressure and pushes the universe apart, or there is some long distance modification of gravity that emerges on very large scales. Um, maybe gravity gets weaker, maybe, maybe it does something funny, and this thing causes some, um, the acceleration of the universe. And today I'm going to talk about the second um, the second possibility, partly because it's kind of emerged as the leading paradigm amongst theorists, um, and partly because this is what allows us to uh, to test this thing in space, because it, it predicts uh, new modifications of general relativity. Um, so next slide, please. So I'm not going to talk about um, a specific theory in general, but what I am going to say is that if you really do think that dark energy is due to a modification of gravity or even any sort of new physics, then very generically, whatever theory you're interested in, whatever formalism you're using, this new energy scale emerges that I've called lambda. So uh, people will refer to this as the dark energy scale, and it's uh, it's a scale of order MeV, and it's connected to the energy density in a fair of dark energy in the universe today. And this scale is very important because it's the scale on which we expect new physics to emerge. And in particular, if we think that dark energy is some sort of modification of gravity, um, then an energies around this scale we expect um, new fifth forces between matter to appear um, and screening. So screening is, is a way of hiding these fifth forces within the solar system um, and also violations of the equivalence principle, which underpin general relativity. So the reason that people who are interested in dark energy are interested in testing it in the solar system is that at this scale, we expect new fifth forces. And by looking for these fifth forces, especially screen fifth forces and equivalence principle violations, by trying to make a direct detection of them, we provide direct evidence of uh, that dark energy is some sort of modification of, of gravity. So next slide, please. So 
So I've, I've mentioned screening mechanisms, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to split them into two broad categories. Um, so I'm going to split them along lines of whether they're best tested using laboratory tests or whether they're um, whether they give long range forces. Um, so the first category is what I call thin shell screening. So for those of you who've heard of these before, these are things like chameleon screening and simitron screening. Um, and these are really parameterized by very strong couplings to matter, in some cases much stronger than gravity. Um, but due to the way the screening operates, they operate on very, very short ranges. And this means they're best probed using laboratory techniques, things like atom interferometry. So I'm gonna defer to Claire's talk for, uh, for a discussion of these, uh, these forces. In this talk, I'm going to focus on the second class, which are called Feinstein screen theories. Um, and for those of you who heard of these before, you may have heard of theories like Galileon theories or camouflage theories. Um, and these theories are really characterized by gravitational strength couplings or even weaker, and they tend to operate on very large ranges. So on the next slide, um, which you can go to, please, I'm going to give you a toy model of how Feinstein screen works. Um, so Feinstein screening works as follows. So what I've got plotted here is the sun, um, clearly, um, and uh, the strength of the fifth force in Weinstein screen theories depends on how close to the, the sun you are. So in these theories, this new scale emerges, which is called the Weinstein radius, and I've plotted it here. Um, if you're outside the Weinstein radius, then everything looks like an enhancement of gravity, and you just have some coupling constant alpha times the Newtonian force. But if you're less than the Weinstein radius, if you're within it, um, there's a, a suppression factor by R divided by RV to some power N. Um, so this is how Weinstein screening works. You have this suppression at small scales. Um, and if you just take the sun and plug in typical parameters for a dark energy theory, you find that the Weinstein radius is of order 100 parsecs. So clearly, if this thing is dark energy, the solar system is deep within the screened regime. And in this case, the acceleration compared to the Newtonian acceleration is of order 10 to the minus 12. So this is a tiny number. Um, so, so, so far, theorists have really been restricted to trying to come up with very clever ways of, of looking for tiny 10 to the minus 12 deviations around, uh, around the Newtonian force. And for this reason, the constraints are currently not overly strong. Um, I won't use the word weak, but they're not, they're not where we would like them to be because you're looking for very small effects on a dominant force. And that's, that's because of the lack of dedicated experiments. Um, so if you just go to the next slide quickly, we should just change, um, change some of the arrows around. Um, so in particular, we're looking for, um, actually, maybe one more, yeah. So um, so the two numbers we're interested in, in oh, sorry, go back to one. So the, the two numbers that we're really interested in going after for these theories are the strength of the coupling to matter, uh, which I call alpha here, and this value n. So each value of n will give you a different, uh, different theory of um, gravity that could be dark energy. Uh, so now if you go to the next slide. One thing I wanted to talk about a bit was the PPN mechanism and its, its limitations for testing dark energy theories and why, why direct detection experiments, which are dedicated to these theories, could, uh, could really yield some vast improvements. Um, so, so what PPN really does is it's a parameterized framework for testing gravity in the solar system. But what it really does is it parameterizes the space-time curvature due to the sun. So it only accounts for one body effects. It assumes all the planets and everything else are test bodies. And this means that by definition, it doesn't include weak equivalence principle violations. And it also makes some very serious assumptions. It makes some assumptions that uh, there are no new physic, no new energy scales in your theory and no new mass scales in your theory. And in particular, this means it doesn't apply to dark energy theories because dark energy theories does have this new scale in it. It has the, uh, the dark energy scale. And for a lot of theories, it has extra masses that have ordered the Hubble scale. So again, um, dark energy theories don't really fall into the PPN there. Uh, the PPN framework. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so for that reason, the best tests on, on some of these Weinstein screen theories actually don't come from PPN. They come from, from thinking of uh, a very extreme ways of testing these, uh, these theories. So um, the, right now, the best way of testing Galileon theories is by looking for effects of strong equivalence principle violations. And the way that, that theorists have come up with doing this is uh, um, because uh, black holes have a no-hair theorem, they don't feel the Galilean fifth forces. If you have a galaxy falling towards a larger galaxy in a cluster or moving in the cosmological background, um, the black hole tends to lag behind the galaxy and you end up with an offset. And so by looking for this offset in, in data, you can, uh, um, you can constrain the Galilean coupling a little bit. And so the most recent bounds, which came out very recently, are this blue region here in the right panel that I'm showing you. So um, 
on on large enough scales you can constrain it to be uh, be of order one or less. Um, so if you go to my final slide, please. Um, this this is why a mission like Goddess would be really useful for testing things like dark energy um, directly in the solar system. Um, so first of all, because it's designed to cancel the effects of Newtonian gravity, you're no longer in this situation where you're looking for a small small 10 to the minus 12 effect on a very large signal. This 10 to the minus 12 effect is the signal. Um, it's also not tied to PPN, it would be dedicated, which means you could try and test these dark energy theories without having to try and force them to fit into a framework um, into which they fundamentally don't belong. Um, and in particular, because they're going to be very sensitive and very precise, you can uh, you can look for, for very weakly coupled uh, Galileo theories and try and go after this uh, this region I've indicated with a cyan arrow here, which uh, which can't be tested with these um, these black hole offsets. So that's that's all of my talk. If you go to the last slide, I'm just thanking you, um, and I'll happily take any questions. Jeremy, I had a quick question. Go for um, it. If you go back, if you go back uh, on slide. Uh, uh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what is the main thing stopping the, uh, the black hole work from, from going lower on that plot? Um, like could it so, be more galaxies or? Um, well, so actually this actually includes quite a lot of galaxies now. So, um, there, there are a few things. One, of course, there are always systematics when you're doing galaxy surveys, which you need to account for. Um, you have to decide whether your, your signal really is an offset black hole or not, because you're not measuring the black hole directly. You're looking for, um, uh, differences between between centroids and then finally if you go to very small scales nonlinear cosmological effects become important and this test actually relies on a key property of Galileons which is the ability to add linear solutions due to the Galileo symmetry so at some point you lose that ability okay that makes sense so there you know there is kind of a hard cutoff there and we won't be able to go past that yeah, I, th I think oh, at some can... point, at some point, there is there there will be a bit of a, a fundamental cutoff. Um, I I did discuss this with the author of this work, and I think you could make some plausibility arguments for going to smaller scales. Um, but at at some point, you really do need the linear field to be added, and at some point, the field is just not linear anymore. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. That that's great, and. Uh... I'm I'm excited about your talk moving us a little bit into uh, how we can use uh, you know direct detection to measure to measure some of these uh, theories and and uh, um, I hope that we can count on you to be part of you know a a white paper or or, or multiple white papers going forward. Uh, are there other questions for Jeremy? And if not, maybe we can move on to the uh, the third talk by Claire. All right, if not, let's let's move on to the talk by uh, Claire. Thanks, Jeremy. So hi, thanks. Thanks for that. Can you hear me OK? Um, yeah, great. Um, so yeah, this talk is going to build very much on what Jeremy has uh, has just been introducing. So if you could already go to the to the next slide. Um, so Jeremy um, introduced these these two concepts of screening. One where the Weinstein screening that he talked about, where the amount of screening you get depends on your distance away from the source. So as as Jeremy said, if you're inside the Weinstein radius, then the fifth force that you feel is suppressed. Uh, and what I'm largely going to talk about here is is the second or the other type of screening mechanism, whereby your your distance dependence stays sort of similar to, to that that we're used to with gravity, you get a one over R squared fall off with distance for the force. But what we're doing here is changing the way in which matter sources that fifth force, sources our scalar field, which is transmitting the fifth force. And I think probably at this point, in light of um, the plenary discussion, it's it's worthwhile saying that this that what we're looking for here really is fundamental physics, um, because we're looking not necessarily to understand exactly how the expansion of the universe is accelerating. We're saying, OK, I have a theory for for why that uh, accelerated expansion is happening. And that theory has these other consequences as well. And those other consequences are things that we can go and look for with dedicated experiments, dedicated missions um, that would that will allow us to test whether our fundamental theories uh, are correct. 
So the type of theory um, fifth force screening that we're talking about here are ones whereby if you've got really tiny objects, um, then uh, the, the extra fifth force that's coming from your dark energy theory is sourced by the whole object. So that's the, the small blue blob on the right hand side of the slide is a small object and the fifth force is sourced by the whole mass. But if we kept adding mass to that object and made it larger and larger, um, we get a picture that's much more like the, the sketch uh, or the cartoon on the left hand side, whereby the, you, you start to develop a central region of that object, which um, is in a, a different regime of behavior of the theory, and you're not sourcing the fifth force um, in that region. It's only a shell of matter, potentially a very thin shell of matter near the surface, which can talk to, to your fifth force. Um, so now if you could um, uh, go on one slide for me. Sorry, could you change the, the slide for me, please? Thanks. Um, so that leads us to these um, violations of the equivalence principle and, and leads us back to a very old idea for testing our, our fundamentals, uh, fundamental physical principles which is the question of whether large objects and small objects fall at the same rate. Now, um, we know uh, that under, under gravity, they do. Gravity doesn't care about the size of the object. Um, but in the presence of these new dark energy forces with these thin shell uh, type effects, what you find is that if you have a small object, then gravity is pulling on the whole mass of the object and the fifth force is pulling on the whole mass of the object and it's pulling it down. Whereas if you had a larger object, gravity is pulling on the whole mass, but the fifth force is only pulling on a tiny fraction of the mass near the surface. And that means the, the smaller object feels much more force than the larger one and so falls faster. Now, this is an idea that um, we have been trying to test for a long time. We, we've got very good tests of the equivalence principle all the way back to Galileo. So why is this something that we can talk about in the context of dark energy? And really the point here is that maybe we haven't looked at testing the equivalence principle either precisely enough or with small enough objects so far. So if you could go on one more slide for me, please. Um, now I'm going to, to go on to, to talk about doing these kinds of tests with laboratory experiments, but I think it's important to mention first that, that that's not necessary. You can do this with um, astrophysical observations, uh, if you want to, you can ask the question, for example, does gas, which is made of sort of very small dust particles, does the gas in a galaxy fall in a gravitational potential uh, at the same rate that the stars fall? The stars are much larger and much denser objects than, than the, the gas um, molecules. And this is a test that, that's been proposed and that people have um, have now carried out with, with recent galaxy surveys and are getting very nice constraints on these models from, from doing this kind of observation. Uh, but as always, when you're trying to test fundamental physics with astronomy, you, you run into systematic problems that are quite challenging. Um, for example, if you're looking for an offset on the sky between the gas in your galaxy and the stars, or how do you, and you're looking for quite extreme offsets, how do you know that the gas and the stars are actually associated with the same galaxy and there's not just a coincidence along the line of sight there? So this really motivates doing these kinds of tests in the laboratory where we have much better control of the systematics um, and we can really be sure what it is that, that we're trying to test. So if you could go on another slide for me, please. Yeah. So um, what, what is plotted here is for one example theory for a, a particular comedian model, um, which has two parameters, the strength of the coupling to matter on the horizontal axis and the strength of the self-interaction of the field on the vertical axis. And you can see the dark energy scale that Jeremy was indicating coming in there uh, as the normalization on the vertical axis. Um, that over a huge part of that parameter space um, that you, we can start to, to think about testing these forces with sufficiently small objects because atoms, it turns out, in a laboratory vacuum uh, are sufficiently small that they feel the fifth force, the whole mass feels the fifth force. There's no thin shell screening effects. Um, the other advantage of doing things in, in the lab is that actually 
um, the, the walls of the lab uh, act as another thin shell for your object, for your, for your fifth force, sorry. And so they, as far as the, the new physics is concerned, they, they screen the interior of your vacuum chamber from the exterior. Now for a laboratory experiment, that's an advantage. Um, that, that gives you quite a clean environment where you have a very tight control of your signal. It's worth mentioning, though, that it can also be a disadvantage. So we've been talking about equivalence principle violations, um, and the microscope mission has obviously very recently been looking for, for those. Um, but it's not sensitive to this kind of dark energy new physics, precisely because the, the whole um, uh, construction of the satellite around the test masses screens any, any new physics effect from their, from their sensors, from their detector. Okay, if you could go on another slide, please. So this is just to give you a, a, a very brief flavor of the kinds of experiments that have been um, have been done in the last, there's really been an explosion of these kinds of searches in the last oh, roughly a decade, maybe five to 10 years. Um, so the, um, there have been tests with using atoms as a probe mass, so atom interferometry, that's the, the uh, experiment sketched in the top left. Um, people using ultra cold neutrons, bouncing them across a mirror, and using that to very precisely measure the forces experienced by the, the, cold, the slowly moving neutrons, that's the, this cartoon sketch on the top right. And people um, optically levitating um, microspheres, so very, very tiny um, micro, nano or microscale objects um, near a, a macroscopic source. And again, looking for the, um, the, the, the fifth forces, any additional forces on these tiny objects that we haven't yet seen on, on larger objects to date. And th these are just a, a couple of examples. There are others, people have done neutron interferometry, um, and um, if anybody is interested in seeing the whole scope, there's a, a review that Jeremy and I wrote a few years ago, which I, I've referenced at the bottom of the slide here. Um, if you could go on one more slide for me. Um, their equivalence principle tests are not the only way of testing um, these theories. So I just wanted to, to mention just to really have given you the full scope of what people are, are doing um, because of the way that this, this screening mechanism works and the way in which um, the shells at the surf, shells of matter at the surface of, of sources are, are very important. You actually find that if you can probe forces on very short ranges, you, you, you can see the effects of the dark energy force for, for a different reason, basically because things are changing very rapidly uh, close to the surface of the field. And so a different set of tests are, are very good at looking for that kind of physics, uh, in particular, uh, the type of experiment that you would normally use to look for Casimir forces, so, so forces at extremely short distances. That's the, the right hand picture and also a, a newer version of that experiment in the bottom left. Um, and of course, the Eort Wash experiment, which has, has done so much good work on terms of looking for modifications of gravity, that's the top left fact picture which also puts bounds on our theories of dark energy and um and the additional forces so if i could go on to the next slide please so then just just to to um to, to bring my talk together to to show you the the power of these types of measurement um, again, these are two examples of of chameleon models um whether the, and their parameter spaces where the bounds of the types of experiments that I've been telling you about are, are plotted. Um, and really, as I was saying, um, if you were to go back 10 years, the parameter space of these models would have been much, much more open um, and you would have had a lot of freedom. And um, by, by thinking carefully about the phenomenology of the theory how, and how it behaves and really identifying the, the best probes to, um, to look for the, the specific signatures, um, we've really been able to make a huge amount of progress in terms of understanding and constraining these models to the point where we're very close to being able to say that some of these theories are, are ruled out experimentally. Um, I think that's it. Maybe if you could just go on to my last slide, I think I have a summary. So I'll, I'll leave it there and, and if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer.
Uh, okay, that's it, Claire. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I really, I really enjoyed that talk. Can we go back to the previous slide, slide eight? Um, so one of my one of my questions. I really like uh, slides like these that show a parameter space and and what we can um, uh, understand from from various uh, um, methods. And so I'm wondering, uh, it, it, you said things have changed a lot in the last 10 years. And if we look ahead, there's of course a lot of uh, experiments uh, in space and on the ground in the coming 10 years. And a, a space mission we start planning now probably has a timeline 10 years or more. Um, do you think that there will be an interesting discovery space uh, for a, a possible space mission 10 years from now? Or do you think things will be shrunk by uh, existing or planned uh, astrophysics missions and, and uh, other ground-based experiments? No, that, that's a great question. Um, I think I think if you're careful about what you choose to go after. So I, I've obviously presented this story to you as a as a success story of laboratory tests, but um, I've focused on on one class of models um, and you can only really these, these kinds of plots um, that Jeremy and I have put together bringing together astrophysics and the lab based uh, tests sort of you can only really do on a model by model basis it's quite hard because these series are, are, are non-linear it's quite hard to do in a, in a model independent way and so it turns out that these particular uh, classes of models that I've been talking about are particularly susceptible to laboratory based tests but there's a whole nother class of, of theories that you're never going to be able to probe, as far as I can tell, with, with lab-based tests. It's not, for, for these theories, it was a question of convincing experimentalists that these were interesting enough theories to, to spend their time on. Whereas for, for the types of theories that Jeremy was talking about, uh, the, the, the signals that you would be looking for in a terrestrial experiment are just so small that they're beyond, you know, the, the, the realm of what is possible in, in, you know, any sort of reasonably short time scale. So I think, I think it does require talking to the community and, and checking and, and picking a tar, picking a sort of class of models as a target that are difficult to get in any other way. But then I think um, there's a real, uh, there's a real excitement about doing a space based mission because you can't get at that physics in any other way. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, are there other questions for for Claire? Uh, maybe just a quick follow up question. So just basically exactly along the same line. When you said there are some theories that you can't test in the lab you, and you said that I, I spoke about. Them, you, did you mean specifically the Einstein screen theories? Um, yeah, that that is what I had in mind. I guess impossible is maybe too strong, but I just think that the the variations are so small on on lab based yeah. scales that it, it seems no, to I, me practically impossible. I, I, to I agree with the impossibility for Galileans. My my question was going to be about the symmetrons. I know the symmetron. Ah, okay. Changing the um, so yeah. so symmetrons. I think um, I think there are prospects for doing better still in the lab for for symmetrons. Thinking more specifically about their their dynamics. Um, but I'd probably not to the same extent uh, of, of ruling out almost all of the parameter space in the way that we've done for the community. Yeah, so so my at least when, when I looked at symmetrons in PPN tests, um, it, it turns out the kind of symmetrons that were constrained were very different from from the lab ones. So I, I was also wondering is is there a range of symmetron theories that could be could be tested in space that would just never be be accessible on Earth? Um, so you, you're pushing me right up to, to getting me to talk about what I'm currently working on, but I have, oh, okay. have some <laughs> ideas for this. I think I think that is something where um, where there's going to be more to say, um, and I kind of don't. This is work in progress that I maybe don't want to talk about here because I'm not sure about the answers yet. But I think yeah. there is there is more to say both in the lab and in the solar system probably. Okay, thanks, Claire. Uh, I do have a question about symmetron model. So uh -huh. is Symmetron less interesting than Chameleon or, or I don't know, because I don't see much uh, effort on Symmetron sort of screening or Symmetron constraint. 
Right. No, thanks. for Thanks. So um, I haven't talked about the symmetry one here because uh, I was asked to give a short talk. And so I focused on on one thing. Personally, I think arguably symmetrons are, are more interesting than chameleons, certainly from a you're coming at this from a particle physics point of view. It's a much easier to motivate potential than the kind of inverse power law that I'm showing you, you here. Um, so partly we talk about chameleons more for historical reasons that this is that they were um, a theory that had been around longer and were better known um, at the time we started doing this work with the lab test. So it made sense in terms of presenting the work to people to, to talk about chameleon models rather than symmetron ones. Um, the same experiments do put constraints on symmetron models. Uh, they're not quite as powerful, and, and as I've kind of hinted at, this is something that I'm thinking about at the moment, um, kind of what you could do to do better for, for symmetry models. Thanks. All right, if there are no other questions for Claire, maybe we can go on to our final talk by uh, Sheng Wei on, on the goddess mission concept. And then uh, if people are around, uh, able to stick around, I think there, there might be some good uh, discussion or overall questions and, and planning after that. Uh, I'll try not to keep you too long because I know we're already over. So go ahead, uh, Sheng Wei, when we get the slides up. Thanks. Sure. OK, so. Um... In the following five, 10 minutes, I'm going to present a mission concept that can really um, do measurement in space, hopefully. Um, next slide, please. So, well, you know all about this, that the dark energy is uh, more than 50% of the universe. And the uh, express said that observation is one thing is just really observe. And what we propose to do is as, uh, as other experiments that we are going to do direct detection of dark energy. That is, we start from the equation of motion of dark energy models, and then we predict forces, and then we design experiment to measure the force directly. This way we can really distinguish between different dark energy models. Um, so I think that's a really powerful complementary approach to observation efforts. Next slide, please. So, well, you know all about this. Um, there are uh, screening effects on dark energy, and we have these uh, screening mechanisms because we don't see dark energy right now in the solar system. So uh, there are two categories, uh, thin shield model and, well, non-thin shield models. And with thin shield models, atoms are good test particles for these kind of um, models. And laboratory efforts are making great progress. Uh, for the uh, Bernstein or Galilean kind of models, it's hard to do laboratory tests because atoms are as good as uh, classical particles that, well, it's not better, so to say. So the uh, Bottom line is that uh, experimentally, dark energy detection is um, hard because the force is weak. And theoretically, I don't think there's one theory, one dark energy theory that is uh, consistent with all uh, observations right now. But, well, even though there's no theory that works, um, more experimental constraints on different theories, different aspects can still point to a new directions of what theory, uh, what the ultimate theory might look like. Next slide, please. So um, as uh, Jeremy pointed out that the dark energy force is uh, like 10 to minus 10 or 10 to minus 12, it's broader than gravity. Um, so we, to do a direct detection, we need a very sensitive sensor. Um, on the other hand, that means we have 10 to 10 larger signal as the background as just due to gravity. The problem now is that with gravity, we only know the gravitational constant to 10 to minus four. So it looks like a mission impossible. So in our proposal, we um, 
proposed to use atom deformators as sensitive sensors um, because atom deformators are supposedly stable and we can use these kind of sensors for a long time averaging and that can reach the sensitivity we need. And then we will design an experiment so that it's less sensitive or insensitive to gravitational field so that whatever we measure is a direct indication of dark energy instead of having to correct for the uh, gravitational force. Next slide, please. So um, atom drum tree, I think uh, most of us are at least heard of it. So basically when atoms are cold enough, like uh, below one microkelvin, they go from uh, classical particle to wavelets, quantum wavelets. With quantum wavelets, they can be split and recombined to interfere. Um, so the uh, scale factor for the uh, acceleration and measured phase is really just fundamental constant. So um, because of that, there are some unique features of atom deformators. First, we use atoms as uh, free falling atoms as inertial reference. That means um, whatever we measure is really measuring reference to uh, um, a, a perfect uh, inertial reference instead of having to correct for other things. Um, another thing is that the scaling factors are just fundamental constants. So in principle, the atom deformators are stable and accurate for a long time. The last part is that atom deformator works because of quantum mechanics works. So any task with um, atom deformator is really quantum effect. So imagine that it's uh, a comparison with quantum deformator, uh, atom deformator with classical uh, sensors. If there's anything different, then <clears throat> it may be due to quantum effect. And it's more interesting that uh, dark energy is sort of a cosmological scale, and we use quantum mechanics to test that. that Maybe something interesting by itself. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we have this uh, uh, mission concept. It comes out of this uh, NIAC study. Um, so basically, uh, we have uh, we propose to have a constellation of four spacecraft orbiting in the solar system. Um, so on each spacecraft, there will be atom deformators as inertial reference. And then between spacecraft, we have laser ranging deformator to measure the absolute distance, velocity, and uh, acceleration between spacecraft. With these information, we can get um, a force gradient tensor, and then we can get the trace of the tensor. Um, so the, we know that the gravity satisfies this uh, 1 over r, this uh, uh, inverse square law property. So um, the, trace of the, uh, the trace of gravity field is, uh, the trace of gravity gradient is 0, while the trace of other dark energy model is not 0. So with this, we can suppress the gravity effect um, uh, sort of to the first order. And um, then, um, yeah, so this is a test of uh, dark energy uh, directly without worrying about gravity field. Next slide, please. So, um, so this is uh, sort of uh, put numbers to this uh, goddess uh, mission concept. So we use a cubic Galilean model as, uh, as an example. Um, so what we think, uh, what we are thinking of is that we have a constellation of four spacecraft orbiting around the sun at a quarter AU and with a spacecraft separation of like 80 million meters. And uh, in principle, we'll get the gradient sensitivity like 10 to minus 20 seconds per second squared every 30 seconds. And the cubic Galilean model predicts that the uh, uh, dark energy field due to the sun would be like eight times 10 to minus 24 per second square at this distance. So that means 
if this mission flies, within two hours, we'll get signal to noise of one of this uh, cubic Galilean signal. Next slide, please. So this is a tentative uh, science traceability metrics. You can see from the left to right that uh, we have science goals and to the end we have some mission uh, parameters. So we can discuss this uh, in more detail later, but just to show that we have some, uh, some design, some thinking, and then um, we're looking to refine this, this kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, science tra trans traceability metrics. Next slide, please. So in addition to measuring the cubic Galilean field, uh, goddess can also measure other things. For example, goddess use uh, cold atoms as a sensor. That means uh, probably it's also sensitive to uh, initial models, uh, but we haven't looked into that. Uh, another thing is that goddess, uh, if you look Closer, you can see that goddess is actually four Lisa constellations or pointing in different directions. So goddess for sure is sensitive to gravitational waves, and maybe this uh, vector measurement will provide something uh, useful or interesting. And um, goddess is look goddess looks similar to some of these uh, dark matter detection scheme, so it's possible that goddess can also measure dark matter. Um, since goddess measures the gravity gradient tensor, so uh, it can be used to measure a lot of uh, controversial stuff like uh, primordial black holes or pregnant nine or tests of uh, um, PBN. So a lot of things can be done with goddess, so it depends on um, what's the primary science goals and what are the uh, so secondary objectives. Next slide, please. So yeah, this is uh, the NIAC, is, NIAC study team actually helped put this uh, uh, concept together. Um, yeah, so with that, thank you. And um, any questions? Thanks, Cheng Wei. Um... I guess I'll, I'll ask a, a question then open it up. So um, my question is, uh, what do you see as the hardest technical part of the mission, Goddess? Uh, well, so in principle, Goddess uses a lot of existing technologies, like laser range interferometer that's been demonstrated on Grace follow on, and atom interferometers are being developed uh, in Europe and in the, uh, on the International Space Station, but the technologies need to be uh, improved for uh, for these kind of missions. Like, for example, atom diffrometers need to have more atoms, much longer interrogation times. That's only available in microgravity environment. So maybe there'll be some intermediate steps like a, a tech demo missions for some of the technology demonstration. Okay, great. Thank, thanks, Sheng Wei. Are there other questions for Sheng Wei? Uh, if not, I think Chris, you might have had a, a more general question or questions. Yeah, so I guess I had some general questions for all of the panel, especially, I mean, yeah, so I guess trying to think about um, next steps for this because there is this whole decadal survey process that's going to be happening and thinking about the best way of putting all of these things together i think there were the talks were pretty different and so uh two questions maybe we'll start with one um which is what do you all think is kind of the best next step both theoretically and experimentally uh for putting all of these different things together and coming up with a cohesive plan that both includes the cosmologist, cosmology community and everyone else. Anyone want to ju jump in? <laughs> Any other panelists want to jump in?
I'm not hearing I, anything. I don't know. I guess I would say right. you, it looks like you've got a pretty good you've got a pretty good starting point from the panel you've got you've got right here, and and maybe just just build out from there as as you need um, more expertise. Um, uh, I, I can't. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I have any other uh, thoughts beyond beyond sort of start trying and and bring in more people as as you need them. All right. So, oh, well, go ahead, Chris. No, I didn't. Sorry. Mean... Uh, maybe like a more pointed question would be like, okay, so there's a couple different things we can think about. You know, one on the theory side is what are the interesting theories that we should be thinking about, like specific theories. Um, another thing could be like, what are the parameterizations that we should be thinking about that actually uh, encompass those and maybe go further than than those specific theories. Uh, then how does this how do we combine this with the galaxy tests, these lab direct lab tests and Earth-based lab tests and uh, the cosmological um, tests? Uh, yeah, I think those are like the main things. And I wasn't sure if people had thoughts on any of these or um, whether these would be good ways to demarcate like white papers. Um, yeah. I'm especially interested in that last part of your question, Chris, if, if people have thoughts on uh, whether we need more than one white paper or a single white paper or wh where those lines would be. And so I'm not trying to present that as an original idea. I'm, I'm echoing Chris's question. I mean, okay, I can I can jump in again if, if uh, um, nobody else is, is has a has an answer. I I think my feeling is it might be better to um, although I would definitely be interested in what Jeremy is thinking as well. Um, it would be better to 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 think. I mean, there are a couple about the the experimental methodologies you want to work with or or that it's possible to work with. Um, and then, you know, we can see from there if there are interesting regions of, of parameter space to, to go after for those theories and then what the best case is. And if, if there's more than one experimental methodology, I could definitely see that being more than one white paper. I wouldn't personally necessarily split things up by theory um, because I think that probably ends up being a bit too bitty and then each one becomes a bit too niche. Um, but that's just my, my take. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with not not splitting things up by theory. Um, I, I guess we discussed this a little bit the other day, but um, what, one thing I suggested to Chris was just along the lines of parameterizations is that rather than, than going for, say, some parameterized framework like PPN is just to assume a general force law with, with different couplings and different powers of N, and that would map onto a lot of the theories which, which are more difficult to test in the lab, so things like camouflage theory and Galileo theories. Um, and something I suggested to Jeff Jewell, I think at the last workshop we had on this was um, was the potential of constraining the graviton mass using Goddess as well, um, because uh, now, now that you've got the numerical tools to go ahead and, and simulate these fields, I think it'd be interesting to see what range of um, of graviton masses you could probe with um, with a Goddess-like mission. So I think we, uh, over here at JPO, we always have, uh, I think, a question that, well, we have some ideas of doing measurement for this type of model, that kind of model, but is this is this model itself interesting, right? Maybe we there are many models, may, many measurement schemes can do many different things, but is it interesting beyond, say, 10 of us here? I think we, we probably need to um, I don't know, I'm not a theorist, but uh, I hope that uh, probably some guidance from uh, theoretical part is, is more useful. All right, I, uh, thanks all uh, panelists and, and people who were able to stick around. Um, you know, I apologize that we, we got off to a, a late start and a slow start, and that probably affected the number of people that could uh, or did attend. Um, 
Are there any other questions or, or final comments? Uh, uh, yeah, this is Brad. Yeah, go ahead. And well, first I want to apologize too. I, I have no idea how we got this so screwed up, but I have spent you know about the last hour doing nothing but scaling back and forth with people who are having problems, particularly like finding your session. And I, we we'll have to run this over again sometime soon. With the you know a crisp <laughs> crisper connection information, but I would like to just suggest that with things like goddess and and uh, experimental uh, physics and space in general, it's, it's a real challenge to build a uh, a broad base of support without a uh, an opportunity for a multi, you know, multiple investigators to, to take part. It can't, you can't really work with just a single, you know, compact science team and, and succeed in, in having a lot of people interested in your in the mission if they don't see how, how it could be a, a, something that the community can take part in. And so for something like Goddess, you really do need to make sure that you've got multiple different uh, uh, opportunities that the, the, the questions that you're probing are broad enough and and the, the capabilities are, are flexible enough that you can do a couple of at least a couple of different uh, you know pursue a couple of different objectives with the, the instruments do that or you, you have to have an experiment that you can sign you know 50 or 100 people up to i i think this is a uh i think that that's a very good point uh and you know we've had a pretty small team at, at largely at jpl working on goddess to to flesh out a concept but as we think about turning a concept into an actual mission that's really one of the things that we wanted uh, or want to do is is reach a broader base and I think the 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 talks we had today, in my opinion, were really good at at uh, sort of laying that out. And and we've got some good people that, that gave the talks. Uh, obviously, that that I hope we can get uh, involved and we can uh, use those talks, which I think are going to be posted online, to point other people to to start that that conversation going forward. So I think this has been uh, a a useful yeah. uh, exercise in, in that regard. Good. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad you feel like we're making progress on that. And I hope in the future, I'd like to see us figure out how to, you know, get a workshop focused on, on those general objectives just to help build the white paper uh, response. I think we're, we're thinking about that and, and, uh, Chris has either volunteered or or Ben volunteered to to take lead on on uh, thinking about a workshop next year. And so I think moving forward, one of the things that we'll do is think about what the what the right timing and format of a workshop would be. And I think that these uh, four talks we've had today, in my opinion, form a really good basis for a potential workshop in addition to the white papers. Great. And I would like to thank uh, ben Goodman, too, who's undoubtedly been dealing with just about as much stress as me trying to figure out how to get the the right WebEx connection out to everybody. So thanks, Ben. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. And I think, uh, yeah, you, you're both uh, free to go have a, 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 a celebratory drink now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll see you guys later. Right, well, any other last minute uh, comments or uh and, and of course thanks to claire who's, who's already to tomorrow um, um stayed on past midnight so okay if there's no other comments or anything then uh, i think we'll break there and uh we will definitely be in touch via via email about how to proceed and and thanks everyone for helping set it up and and for coming and, and a good conversation. It's a really good talks.
Uh, these are actually very good reference uh, material for me as well as I think about how to go ahead. All right. Thanks, all. Thank you. Have a Bye. Good day. Bye.